Hello and welcome to Sharon Local History. Um, in this video I would like to tell you some basics about schooling in 19th century. I will talk about um, basic schooling in New England and then I will tell you more about schooling in Sharon, Massachusetts. So um, basically all the colonies in New England were required to set up schools and many did so. Towns in 1830s New England were divided into a dozen or more neighborhood school districts, each with its own schoolhouse. Supported by property taxes, any child could attend school, although no one was required to. This easy access to education led to a higher rate of literacy in New England. The late 1830s, most New Englanders could read write and do basic arithmetics. This was called three R's. That said, elementary education was considered enough for farmers, housewives and tradesmen, although a few children went to academy, which was private secondary school. Only one or two professional men in any country town had attended college. One-room schoolhouses were commonplace in rural portions of various countries. Um, in the United States, historic one-room schoolhouse has widely been preserved and are celebrated as symbols of frontier values and of local and national development. Rural areas were just too sparsely populated to support multiple classrooms, so towns built one-room schools about 20 by 30 feet large. All of the students met in that one single room. Most buildings were of simple frame construction, some with the school bell on the cupola. In some locations, the schoolhouses were painted red, but most of them were white. Here is an example of um, interior of one schoolhouse. This is a schoolhouse in the amazing Stourbridge village. You can see simple uh, one room uh, classroom with wooden desks and um, benches. A simple floor that's sloping right here. So the students on the back could see the teacher. This is the teacher's desk. Um, you can also see a wood stove here, simple wood stove that uh, was the only way to keep the schoolhouse warm in the winter time. Before students enter the classroom, they usually took off their coats, especially in winter time, and um, hung them outside of the classroom on the coat hangers. Simple and practical. Using the bathroom was no fun. This is um, an outhouse that is next to the schoolhouse at Sturbridge Village. So yes, children had to leave the building whenever they needed to use the bathroom, no matter what the weather was like. School was in session five and a half days of a week for three months term in summer and another in winter. Boys sat on one side and the girls on the other. The youngest and smallest children sat close to the front, while the older, taller students sat further back. There were no grades. Students ranged from four years old to well into their teens, attending until parents felt that they had learned enough or until their labor was required at home. A single room had between 20 to 40 kids, at times even 80 students in one single room. And now let's talk about teachers. The schoolmaster or mistress was typically just a teenager or young adult hired for a single three-month term. Most of them were only 15 to 20 years old. It means they were like close age-wise with the students they were teaching. They could sit for their teaching certificate as long as they had graduated from school. Teaching standards often varied from school to school as the teacher was compelled to coach children of all ages and all grades within one room 
regardless of the area of main competence. A single teacher taught academic basics to several grade levels of children. The teachers were very special people. On the top of teaching, they had to take care of the schoolhouse and well-being of the students. During the winter month, they would get to the school early to get the fire started in the potbelly stove, so the building will be nice and warm for the students. On many occasions, they would prepare a hot noon meal on the top of the stove, usually consisting of a soup or stew of some kind. The first school teachers were either men or more likely unmarried women. If they married, they had to give up their job. The turnover rate for teachers were fairly high as women married and started their own families. A teacher's salary in 1800s was about 10 to 15 dollars each month. Towards the end of the century, it was averaging about 20 dollars a month. So the teachers didn't really make much money. A male teacher and his family often lived in a home next to next door to school. Uh, it was usually a build, smaller building attached to school. It was called teacherage. Women teachers would be housed with one of the families whose children attended the school. Um, often they had to share a room with the children. Apparently, teachers weren't allowed to attend public performances or dances. Male teachers were permitted to date one night a week or two if they attended church regularly. A typical school day was from 9 a.m. in the morning until 4 p.m. in the afternoon. The kids had recess a few times a day for about 15 minutes and they had one hour period for lunch. Children from the age of five would go to school daily through the week and then on weekends would be expected to come back and help to clean up the schoolhouse. The younger students would be given responsibilities according to their size and gender, such as cleaning the blackboard, taking the erasers outside or for dusting, plus other duties that they were capable of doing. The older students were given the responsibility of bringing in water, carrying in coal or wood for the stove. Teachers had to be creative and work with whatever supplies they had. They used memorization, reciting and oral testing to teach reading, spelling, spelling, arithmetics and history. Without group instruction, pupils typically studied on their own from textbooks. The mark of a good student was the ability to memorize the material. Many parents could not afford textbooks and so they sent their children to school with any book from home, usually the Bible, for instructions in reading. Sanford Waters Billings was a resident of Sharon. He was a politician as well as teacher, an incredible person. And he had written a piece of legislation by which textbooks were purchased for students from the state funds relieving parents of the expenses and thereby ensuring that every student had a textbook. We have a video about um, Sanford Waters Billings on our channel. Please feel free to check it out. Discipline could be difficult at times, especially when some of the older boys were taller than the teacher herself or himself. Infractions were dealt with swiftly and often severely, Corporal punishment with hickory switches and rulers was not unusual. The picture of a pupil sitting on a chair in the corner with a dance cap on his head was a form of punishment used for a child that hadn't done his lessons or who spoke out of turn, or similar minor offense. As was then the custom, our town was divided into school districts and we find still standing some of the stones which were set to mark the boundaries of these designated areas. One such, a squared granite stone similar to those used for marking town lines, may be seen on northwest side of Quincy Street about midway between Ames Street and Massapoak Lake. 
This stone is set in the end of an ancient dam which crosses the swamp and Massapoak Brook at this point. It is marked C on the swamp side and E on the street side. It signifies the line between center and east school districts. A similar stone set by the roadside about midway along the easterly shore of Massapoak is marked C and its easterly side and S on its southerly side, indicating that the South School District extended to this point. Here is a plan of Sharon dated 1794 to 1795. Um, I mark the original schoolhouses that we know of and their location. So um, the first one is um, the schoolhouse that is basically now on North Main Street. Um, another one was the old schoolhouse on uh, the intersection of Old Post Road and Walpole Street. Next one was um, down on what is now South Main Street. Um, it is was close to the Billings Pond. Um, another one was down south of uh, Lake Massapoak and it was on what is now Massapoak Avenue and Lakeview Street. And um, another one that is still standing um, and it's beautiful private residence now was on East Street. And last one was the North uh, Schoolhouse was on Norwood Street. Now I will show you a map from 1830 and mark each of the schoolhouses that we know of and share some information that volunteers over the years collected. We believe that the first center district school was the one on North Main Street. Um, the North Main Street was actually called the Great Road. It was erected in 1710 on North Main Street. You can see it on both of the maps. Um, it was located opposite what is now Brook Road and it is visible on a map from uh, 1794 as well as the map from 1830. The building was eventually moved to a site beside the first congregational church it remained there until the late 1800s and then it was moved again to 50 Quincy Street and it became part of the house. We know very little of the old schoolhouse except that it stood at the junction of the Old Post Road and Walpole Street for at least 38 years. It may have been the first West schoolhouse. Across the meadow and swamp to the west of the old schoolhouse location is a brook which flows northerly and easterly emptying into the Neponset River in Walpole. This stream for about three quarters of a mile marks the boundary line between Walpole and Sharon and is noted on our maps as a school meadow brook, the meadow adjoining being marked school meadow. The North District Schoolhouse was located easterly side of the country road, which is called Norwood Street now, just north of the present Edge Hill Road. This building stood until March 25, 1910, when it was burned down in a forest fire, which ravaged this section. Advantage was later taken of the stone foundation for the erection of a bungalow upon this spot. It's then Edge Hill Road now. The West School District House, also called Little Red Schoolhouse, was built sometime before 1800s. The schoolhouse stood until 1869 on the westerly side of Moose Hill Road near South Main Street. This schoolhouse was replaced in 1869 for improved new building. In the early 1900s, the property was sold and it is a private home now. The South District Schoolhouse, which stood at the corner of Mansfield Street, which is now called Massapoak Avenue, and Lakeview Street, was destroyed by fire in the 1920s, 
leaving a balance of one cellar hall to the credit of educational institutions in that vicinity. The burning of this schoolhouse is a mystery. Um, the, there was another schoolhouse in Foxborough and another in Easton, and they also succumbed to the torch in the same manner and on the same night. Our schoolhouse he referred to was sometimes known as the New South School and was not the first in this district. As early as 1794 and probably much earlier, one was located at the corner of former Morse and Mansfield, Lakeview Streets, near the old Tolman House, and about a quarter of a mile northward, northerly of the above. This was called the Meshepoak School. The last, but certainly not least, is the schoolhouse on East Street. Um, the first East School was built on the opposite side of the road. It was remodeled and eventually became a private residence. The second schoolhouse representing this district was built prior to 1830s on the site of um, former Stanke House. This was destroyed by fire of unknown origin in March 3rd, 1877, and immediately after was the third and still existing schoolhouse built. This house was also remodeled and eventually became private residence. By 1903, Sharon Pines became dissatisfied with the lack of a well at the South School, the shabby conditions of the North School, and the closing of the West School for six days when no substitute could be secured for a sick teacher. Parents of the districts renewed their demand for a center school with transportation provided. By 1907, all the district schools were closed and classes were consolidated at the center school. We are almost at the end of our video. Um, it is important to mention that schools in Sharon were at first poorly attended. Some families, burdened with the daily responsibility of making a living, required that their children stay at home and work on the farm. Massachusetts became the first U.S. state to enact a compulsory education law in 1852, having already passed a similar law in 1647, when it was still a British colony. The 1852 law required every city and town to offer primary school, Focusing on grammar and basic arithmetics, the state began requiring children between ages 8 and 14 attend school. Thank you for watching Sharon Local History. This was just part one about education in Sharon. We will continue with part two and most likely three. Thank you.